after the meeting, the Miami Board, Miami Township Board of Trustee meeting for June twenty first, two thousand twenty three. Um, agenda. Um, like to start by entertaining a motion to adopt the minutes of June twenty one, twenty twenty three. So moved. I'll second. All right. Any discussion about these minutes? I don't know. Nope. Second. 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 To approve the payment of bills in the amount of $47,360.30. Um, that's general fund $8,503.87. Fire $32,931.80. EMS $230.23. Cemetery $2,816.72. Road and bridges $2,877.68. Can I get a motion? I so move. Second. Anybody have any? Uh, yeah. That's not a lot of money. Um, it's $600,000 a year. Well, yeah. Or, no, excuse me. It would be uh, 1200000 um, Still quite low. Did he mention to me there was no overtime this, this time? I'm, I'm, I'm not challenging this, I'm just exclaiming on it being. Yeah, yeah, low. it is low. Um, shall we vote? We move in segment to uh, approve payment of bills in the amount of $47,360.30 as enumerated. And Mr. Halifer? Yes. Mr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Motion is approved. That is very low number. Okay, we had correspondence this month, the U.S. Department of Treasury SLF slurf funds. Um, I know that's um, the ARPA stuff and Chris here. We got to do that. Um, I should put more there, um, you know, do the yearly. I have done that. You have? Yes, this, okay. is, this is a notification that says they want you to put a reclassification on any of the subcontractors that you pay for. Mm -hmm. Oh, that the, the yeah. one is used for. Yeah, we haven't gotten that far yet. We probably won't have some characters. Okay. okay. Um, this one, MBRPC Safe Streets for All Grant. Was that the one you already sent the letter of support for? It was. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll do that. They need that by July 10th. So I don't need them there. Oh, do we have Remind to remind me that? which which they? This is MBRPC, and they are. But who's applying for a grant? They, they are on behalf of the oh. organization, the Miami Valley Regional okay. Planning. Okay. And it's about safe streets. It's not about crime and things like that. It's about safety on roads, and it's all connected to the um, tsunami of um, infrastructure dollars coming. And um, do we need to vote that that we would um, support them? They sent an email um, with information about different things the grant could be used for. Or is, this, is this the same thing that Stephanie Goff is, is putting out and she wants a letter of support? It's, it sounds like she's asking for the letter of support the grant of this MBRPC program for the funding. For the grant. Mm -hmm. For the grant. Yeah. yeah. Would well, like I just write that? I would, I would, I would move that. that we would sign a letter of support for the uh, grant. For the? Uh, Safe Streets grant. I second that. And city, so that's Safe Streets for All. That's the name of the grant. Um, oh, you have that. Any further discussion? May we vote, please? We move and second it to submit a letter of support to MPRPC and Reference the state safe streets for all grants. Uh, Mr. Mature. Yes. Mr. Hollister. Yes. Ms. Moyer. Yes. Motion passed. Um, Green County Board of Health activity report. Um, 
GCTA, um, Green County Township Association meeting dinner of July 11th, RSVP by tomorrow. They want us to leave an answer on an answering machine today. So if anybody else is going, I'll, I'll, I'm going. I'll report back. This is in uh, South, three, three townships in Southeast County. Yeah. And, and we're there, it's in some barn in Jamestown. Mm -hmm. it is. It's a beautiful barn. I'll go. If anybody else wants to go, I, I'll tell them two or three. Okay, I'm good. Um, yeah. I'll RSVP tomorrow. Um, Ohio cemeteries, a detailed description and explanation. Oh, no, that's a typo. It's not Ohio cemeteries. It's mm -hmm. Ohio concrete. It's Ohio concrete. Yeah, got cemetery in the brain. <laughs> Ohio concrete. It was a detailed, a very detailed and descriptive explanation. I was trying to imagine the person writing it of a very detailed explanation of why the concrete is flaking at the fire station. And they suggested a remedy. Um, what, what, say, what was our purpose? Was our purpose to get them to fix it? And our purpose was to have an assessment and a determination of what the problem was. And by doing that, it basically falls down to, from our end of it, the contractor not using a particular uh, sealant one particular sealant instead of another particular sealant when the when the job was done had they used the better proceed the other sealant the possibility of the flaking would not have been as high as it is now so the question is where do we go from here do we just do the darn thing or do we ask them to do it <coughs> well that's i'm i have asked our remember jason funderberg was our project mm -hmm. manager mm -hmm. that we hired from uh the wider group, and I've asked him to weigh in whether he feels it's appropriate that we uh, uh, address it through through going through Fillmore Construction and put it down, and asking them to seal it at their own expense, or not, or do we just do it ourselves? not do it ourselves, but have it done ourselves and pay for it, or go through the fun of going through the prosecutor's office of having them try and force Fillmore to, to remedy that situation. The, the, bottom, the bottom line, and I haven't heard back from Jason yet, the bottom line is, as we've talked at meetings and with other people who know Samad, and just in general, it's been so long now, it's pretty much just the top 16th of an inch that's a problem and it will continue to unattended unremedied it will continue to flake off but it is of, of no detriment to the structural integrity of the cement itself there's no oh. other than it does it's not going to look pretty it, it's not going to be a problem with the integrity of it well, it's, it's going to flake off and then that's it mm -hmm. and not 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 all of it there's no idea how much it's how much may come off with a lot of it had to do with how much water we put on it, what the temperature was when that particular pad was laid versus when the other pads were laid, because they weren't all done at the same time. Anyway, so uh, I'm gonna start with Jason and see where we go from there, and then and then we'll come back and decide what we want to do. All righty. We received correspondence from MVRPC age friendly network meeting announcement. I should be interested in age friendly networks being getting to advance my <laughs> but I'm just not. Um, um, I should be, but anyway, they're, they're doing a lot. When I go to these meetings, they're talking about age friendly networks a lot. And I always think, is there something, these little grants they have for age friendly, is there something in our township that would qualify for one of these? But so far, nothing's come to me. Um, or, or some way we could help the aging in our township. Um, well, we can work with the organizations that are already working with the aging in our township, which are doing fairly good jobs, as far as I know. I mean, yep. senior, senior citizens, citizens here in town represent, doesn't limit itself to Yellow Springs. Green County Council on Aging obviously doesn't limit themselves to Yellow Springs. And both of those organizations 
in my limited experience, are working hard to help our aging population. They probably know about the Council on Aging, but maybe not so much connected with the, the, the YS. I was on that committee when I was with oh. MBRBC. Oh, sorry. And they had, um, I felt they had a real strong feel for all the different communities and you know what was being done in the communities. There was another woman, I don't want to say a name that I'm not 100% sure of, who was the Village of Yellow Springs representative on the uh, on the age rank friendly com oh, okay. commission also. And she was quite active. So I'm okay. pretty so, sure they're not overlooking any possibilities yeah. in, in the Yellow Springs Miami Township. That sounds great. Um, thank you, Chris, for doing the o EPA, Ohio EPA Division of Surface and Water. They want a notice of termination for yeah. our billing here. Yeah, I think that's a final and official. Yeah, it looked like talking. it was. Yeah. Um, and then that Ohio Auditor basic audit of RPCC engagement letter. Mm -hmm. OTA legislative alert. Um, I don't know how we should this. David Graham, the Green County Auditor, he had a little presentation about CUAVs. At, at the Regional Planning Commission meeting. Cool. That should okay, all. Get it. I have a copy of that presentation. Yeah, he sent it to us too. Yeah. He sent it to us, but thank you. Um, Green County sent us notice that, they, that we're on notice. We're on their agenda for July 27th, I think, regarding our um, two year moratorium on solar. And, Everything south and east of the Little Miami River. Yeah, that that'll be sort of a pro forma ratification. Pro forma meaning done deal. Yeah, they're oh. They'll just Please. do it. Even if public shows up. Um, okay. Does it uh, well, no, it's possible that <laughs> I mean, it's will possible. show up and convince them to change. Oh. Oh, this thing, this. Star Ohio State Treasury Authorized Signer certi Certification Form. Did you, did, any, did you look at this? Is that something me and Margaret need to go down and get? We need a second signature on all things now, or? You, you need one, number one, you need to find out whether we're still participating in the Star Ohio State Treasury Authorization or State Treasury. Um, I thought we weren't because their interest rates at in the past, it used to be higher than like U.S. Bank or um, that's who we're primarily doing. And so we decided to just consolidate everything into one okay, investment so. fund. So if we're not using it, it doesn't really matter. We okay. authorize signatures, signatures, uh, and I'm not sure what, which elected official that they would require for an authorized signature. Signature. I think I'm not. I could, I'd, I'd hate to give you the responsibility of signing all these hundred thousand dollar checks to <laughs> blank who whoever, but anyway. I don't want that responsibility. That's what that's about. And Lee Sloan, our attorney, kind of, um, let us know the OPS, the citing board motion to dismiss the appeal to the Supreme Court. And I kind of understand that. Um, and there were three or four additional course pieces of correspondence that are in there, and they're under a sticky note that says new. We'll just hold those over till the, the next meeting okay. and not not file them yet. Um, we have a number of issues of queries regarding zoning procedures and commissions have been received in recent weeks. We are taking this opportunity to fully investigate claims and consider policy changes. We're not prepared to speak about these until our inquiry is complete. Um, all right. Um, fire department report. We got it. I Colin, I saw you brought one in. Are there copies? Actually, it's a new thing we're just going to share. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I was kidding. Okay. Okay. This is a new thing in email here at the township. Okay, uh, since the last board meeting, there have been 33 EMS incidents and 12 fire <coughs> incidents. Um, Independence Day was uh, yesterday. So the crew had uh, five 
incidents uh, from 7 a.m. until midnight, uh, including unfortunately a fatal car versus bicycle crash on uh, Polkett Road. Uh, the duty crew also participated in the parade, and then we had five additional personnel come in to help staff the fireworks. Uh, fireworks were inspected and permitted by our staff. Show went off very well. Well received by the public. We also gave out glow sticks to the crowd, which um, were very well received. Our crews were uh, hoarded by children and adults to get glow sticks, which was good. I'm perpetually shocked that in a town as on the cutting edge and aware and we must protect our children that people still give 3,000 degree like phosphorus sticks to their kids to run around. <laughs> um, luckily, the worst thing that can happen with a glow stick is you end up, you know, blowing. <laughs> or going to a rave, I guess, but you know, who knows. Um, the post show, the exhibitor did discover two of his um, boxes uh, and not fully discharged, so uh, we got another show afterwards and we manually lift them. So that was fun. You know what? I thought I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, who's got fireworks like that? Originally, um, he wanted our crew just to wipe them down, which is one way to dispose of them. I guess he just decided, well, that's a waste of money. So, yeah. <laughs> so they shut them off and it all worked out. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. solves a mystery for me. There you go. Uh, it is interesting, actually, with the, this is the first year that the state law has been in effect that allows every Tom, Dick, and Harry to shoot off fireworks at certain times of the year. I think they did. And they did, actually. <laughs> uh, and some are nicer than the current, the, the, the exhibitors are not very happy that they have to, you know, get trained and get certified and licensed. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, Jim Bob walks into Sad Sam's and gets a, so, but. Um, yeah, Jim Bob was at Dollar General. Jim Bob was, yeah. I probably I think uh, the state probably made a lot of tax money off of Jim Bob, so that's probably good, I guess. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Assistant Chief Powell mentioned that at the last meeting that he had talked about street fair. Um, so we kind of worked out some costs here, uh, not including potential overtime costs. Um, that was too much advanced math for the 23 minutes before this. I was putting this together. So. Um, but it costs not including the duty crew who would have been here anyway. Um, our personnel costs were $2,482.94. So that was in the extra personnel that were brought in to help cover the event. Excuse me. We invoiced the chamber for $1,050. Um, so we recouped 42% of our staffing costs. Um, you know, there is. In the world of emergency planning or emergency management, I mean, the reality is you never recoup your costs from a public event. Um, FEMA and the USDOT have done a study, and they studied all the big major metropolitan agencies that have planned special events, um, and found that um, the average cost of co the average rate of cost recovery is thirty nine percent. Ranges from a high in California, Los Angeles County, of eighty five percent of their costs recouped. Uh, which is because California has a law requiring people to pay a certain amount. Uh, to a low of New York City, actually, where they only recoup about 25% of their costs. Um, and these are for planned special events. Obviously, if you've got to respond to a riot, you know, you're not, you're not getting any money for that. There's no way to We started building the chamber 2008 during the winter years. Mm -hmm. um, just to help defray costs, and it was actually, we called it an emergency preparedness fee, which was something FEMA recommended at the time. So we currently bill the chamber $5 per craft vendor booth and $15 per food vendor booth. The higher rate on the food vendors is because we have to inspect them. Um, so that was that, that's what, and then we also bill them for a $25 festival permit, which is required under the fire code and a $50 tent permit for the food tent at the funeral home. Now, is that included in this fee? No, that's on top, so it's 75 bucks plus 100, uh, plus 1,050. Oh, yeah, those are separately invoiced. That's okay, but the inspections, the food cart trucks yeah. inspections are separate. Yes, but they're not, we don't bill for the food truck. Um, we don't bill for inspections. Oh, you don't? Yeah. Oh, okay, I thought it was, I thought it was. Um, okay. So obviously we're not covering all our costs. The one that's always got me is the festival permit. Um, the fire code requires us to issue a, a permit for anything that's gonna have more than a thousand people. 
Um, we have to verify everything on the planet. We have to create a public safety plan. Uh, there's tons of work that goes into it, and we're charging 25. It's one of our cheapest permits, which I'm not really sure why. We charge $25. Yeah, to or how did that happen? To permit um, the street fair? Yeah, there were about 48 hours of planning that went into every street fair to, to prepare for it. So we tried out a new staffing model this time for the street fair. We didn't bill for it, but um, it was successful. Basically, especially now that we're not right downtown, which was easy, we could all be there and just show eyes. Um, now that we're here, we kept the duty crew here and they were supplemented a little bit to handle calls in the in the village and the township. And then we dedicated an ambulance, a two person bike team, and a supervisor to the street fair. All volunteer? Oh, God, no. No, no, no. <laughs> I, got, I had two volunteers that day, so. Um, now, why do that? Because there's liability involved. We have to we have to provide the service to an event that has 23,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have to do it for free. Correct. So, what we're looking at then for the fall mm -hmm. would be to do the same staff model for their dedicated to that event. So, two person ambulance crew, two person bike team, and a supervisor who's also a fire inspector. So, the ambulance crew is $100 per hour, $50 per person. Uh, the bike team is also $100 per hour, and uh, the inspector is $75 per hour. Uh, these are fees that we've already established with the Dave Chappelle shows uh, for standbys that were required for their fireworks. Mm -hmm. um, the Yellow Springs Fireworks, obviously, it's, that's a public, municipal, open thing, so we don't bill for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we would probably be very unpopular. Um, so, is that the staffing code, the 2482? Yes. That's the not including the duty, the crew that was here. Anyway. Right, I got it. So, but that's the fire yeah. or where's it said? Okay, and that's including the two volunteers because they get reimbursed for being there. So, um, okay, so are you going to build that in? Not you. Are we going to build that in the fall? That's the plan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, Danny and I have worked on this together, so he's on board. And actually, I've already talked to Alex Price, who's with Mills Park Hotel, who was handling the all the financial aspects of the street fair because mm -hmm. they're, they're working. Chamber. Mm -hmm. um, it is like yeah. <laughs> which is different. I mean, in previous chamber administrations, right. the thought of any cost coming, mm -hmm. you know, they had to pay was, as you know, mm -hmm. taboo. I mean, getting that thousand dollar and fifty fee under Karen was uh, yeah. it took a lot of. Uh, it's coming out of her pocket. Yeah, yeah clearly. Um, but also this this pesky twenty five dollar permit fee, which drives me nuts. Doing research, I found that most communities, when they have to do these things, particularly in Ohio, where it's required by the code, you charge a certain amount per anticipated attendance. Um, so the village, on any of their permits, you have to put it in a realistic. Mm -hmm. Like the chamber couldn't put 12 people. <laughs> uh, we know that's not true. So they indicated, I think, on their permit, 20, 15 to 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. We would charge eight cents, which seems to be the going rate around the state. Um, per anticipated person. Mm -hmm. um, now, this street fair, we found out they had 23,000 people. We did the count. That was part of the service that we did. Um, so, you know, in the future, we could say, okay, well, you're anticipating 23,000 for a fall street fair. That's going to be another 1,840 bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, which would that cover pretty much? Isn't all the fall that? typically larger than the spring? That's been bantied around. I don't necessarily recall that. Um, unless it's one of those beautiful October, you know, uh, used to be called Indian summer, I don't know what more yeah. proper term is now, but, um, you know, those can be massive, but typically if it's a dreary Ohio October, it's, it's usually a smaller event. It's still, no matter how you slice it, it's still, it's still big and it's still a strain on our How do you go about resources. telling them we're raising our fee from $25 to 800, 1800? Um, luckily the fire code, uh, gives us the ability to set fees as reasonable based on our, our needs and our, our services. So, uh, and we've always tried to do that. We just, as, I mean, as the village is growing, it's a debt side of things. I don't mean the government, but the village in general. You know, obviously it's a struggle for both of us, both the township and the village to provide yeah. services. Um, well, now that we have to pay, pay for people to do this, we, you know, yeah, in my opinion, we need to be reimbursed for it. Now I'd like Madam Chair to pull the board and see if how many people agree with Colin's idea? 
to charge for the um, investable permit side of it? Is well, that well, the whole thing. Right? The, what, what's interesting is that, the, that the standard rate of eight cents per person turned out to reflect your actual costs. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's. Yeah, I don't that's, know how that worked, but it did. So. It did this time around, anyway, yeah. so that's that's good. This would also be implemented for other, but not just the two street fairs. Mm -hmm. You know, Pride, Yellow Springs Pride mm -hmm. um, is another one. Uh, and we, we're working on a table um, that hopefully we'll have for the next meeting. Well, we'll have for the next meeting, so it's two weeks from now. Um, that we would be given, that would be given to event planners, people who are proposing to do an event, and would say, based on your anticipated this is what we're requiring. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so for something like Pride, they were anticipating 5,000 people. Typically, that's not something we would worry about staffing specifically. Mm -hmm. What we did for Pride is we did upstaff the duty crew. We added two more people during the event. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it turned out not to be that busy at all. But, but you know, it's intermittent. Yeah, right. uh, we've had street fairs with 20,000 people and no calls. Mm -hmm. and a, a fall one with 28 calls and 10,000 people. So you never, you know, you never really know. Um, but it would say, you know, under a thousand people, just let us know you're doing it. Uh, you know, a thousand to 2,500 provide for first aid. So like with Pride, we told them they had to provide their own first aid. So they worked with Green County Public Health and had a, a staff booth. Typically for most events and plan, say, you know, plan special events, once you get about 5,000 anticipated people, that's when we need to start providing the, the staffing uh, mm -hmm. for that. Uh, and the Ohio Administrative Code gives us you know, the ability to do that. Uh, so then we'd have different levels. Something at the street fair level above 10,000, that's when we're gonna have an ambulance, mm -hmm. a bike team, and a supervisor dedicated for that event. Mm -hmm. um, we're also looking in the future, Nate's examining um, what other jurisdictions do with food trucks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was, we've always inspected them, but that, then the code changed four or five years ago requiring us now to inspect them. Yeah. So he's actually looking at an annual thing where a lot of communities do this. They come in one day, we, they're all lined up, we go through and inspect them, when they pass, they get a sticker, for, good for the year. Oh, rather right. than doing it at every yeah. event, they show up. Now there's some, like at Street Fair, you're gonna have some fly-by-night vendors who show up, but most of the people at Street Fair are, nowadays, the food vendors, are professional food truck people. Mm -hmm. So that would uh, that would really work for them and cut down our workload, you know, for the food truck event, the food truck is that the food inspections take takes maybe about two hours uh, in the morning. You have any idea where all these trucks come from? Um, well, the majority of this year uh, for the chambers of I mean for the chambers property we you know the off stuff Tom's yeah Nipper that's all different but most of the chamber stuff are um, a concession company. Um, I can't remember the name of the company. But they do, you know, they go all over the state and do fairs and festivals and all that kind of stuff. And what's nice is they're always in self contained, mm -hmm. professionally manufactured vehicles. So, how would you guys do a, a one time around them, give them their sticker or whatever, if it comes all over? You tell them, I mean, you put it out on their the food truck network or whatever. <laughs> um, they have an option, they don't have to come for the annual inspection. But then we're going to inspect them every single time they're here, okay. which is more of a hassle for them. Um, so it just streamlines the process for all of us. We're big enough in Yellow Springs in terms of the activity between festivals, the, the regular food trucks at the, um, the brewery, that we, we could justify saying, you know, bring your trucks here on this date, we'll do an inspection. Um, yeah. Cedarville probably couldn't do that. So. These two things together, I mean, the permit and the, the direct billing for staff costs, would cover all of our costs. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is if we transport someone from the street fair, we are billing them, too. So, not the chamber, but that patient is getting billed. So, those costs are covered. Um, it's just our staffing costs. So, for instance, you know, we've got fireworks at um, we're in Pavilion on Saturday. Um, I don't know if that was now, but now breaking news. Um, so we'll have a crew out there because we have that's required by law. So we'll have an ambulance, we'll have a fire truck, and an inspector. Uh, and we build Steve last year with no no questions asked, no problem. It's live Nation, but Steve mm -hmm. handles it. Uh, they did it without a problem. Mm -hmm. 
And then we'll have a paramedic out there actually all three nights as well. Who's being paid okay. directly. Right. Okay. When, when you said you'd like me to poll the board of trustees, what did you mean? <laughs> well, why was that different than discussion? Uh, it's not. Asking for a motion? Or yeah. Give them the go ahead to get yeah. these in. Well, we've heard a lot from Colin and a little from us. Okay. Do you have any more? Uh, yeah, you made a, a comment a moment ago. This would cover our costs. And then earlier, you spoke of covering 42% of costs. That's for public. Well, for the street fair, this would cover, in theory, without all the street costs. fair. Going forward, we're looking at having a larger percentage of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and I would under I, I would assume, much like any other invoice type thing, Margaret can then credit that income towards our salary fund or something. Sure. Whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. So I, Paul, I have just a, a question, which is I don't know exactly what an inspection of a food truck involves, but isn't it kind of a different situation where they all show up and they're not actually selling food, <laughs> and when you go and inspect them, when they're actually in the process? A, a lot of times we will inspect them before they start. Okay. Um, I just wonder, you know, if they're coming to the inspection, okay, everybody's right. going to be just fine, yeah. and, and there's no pressure to. Right. Um, and we at inspect all. most most inspections we conduct are actually usually not under. Under adverse conditions. Yes. Okay. And with the exception of like the restaurants, we try and go in when they have customers. Mm -hmm. But then that's also like some of these places, like the Wins isn't a big issue because it's a bigger place. But like, is it not room? To do we've it done inspections room? at uh, Sunrise when they're hopping and they're cooking. And then this, I don't even know how they do that. It's amazing. Yeah, there's hard, it's hard. It's it's amazing. Me, like, you, know, <laughs> you know, the last time we did it, we actually, it was me and two brand new inspectors. So it was three of us in there. They had a guy fixing the HVAC success. Hmm. Yeah, I felt bad for the owner, but. Um, okay, I, yeah, I wasn't trying to be picky about this. Right. Like, oh, that's kind of a different climate for the inspection. Yeah. Does that hurt anything you're telling me? No, it doesn't really. Yeah, I typically we're there before they even started serving. I'll say I'm the health department, actually. So. I, I also have a question, if I may. So if you're billing based on anticipated attendance, in the unlikely scenario that your anticipation, your anticipated number falls significantly short of the crowds that come to town, mm -hmm. how would the fire department adapt? Uh, basically, what I've learned from other agencies is you, pay, you do it based on your anticipated, and then you bill after the event. Okay. So it's built in arrears, so that way if something like that does happen, if 1,200 people show up because it's pouring rain all day, mm -hmm. then we can adjust that before we issue the bill. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if you're not actually paying your people to be there anyway. Right, and if they have to be there, then we still have that cost. But I mean, you know, usually you can look at the weather ahead of time and say, okay, it's mm -hmm. supposed to be 42 degrees and pouring rain all day, and the chamber says, well, we're still doing it. Mm -hmm. And you know, there will be people who show up, but we probably can handle that with our duty crew at that point. For, um, sunny, for sunny street fair days, is uh, 23,000 kind of your baseline? At this point, because we actually did an ca uh, actual count for the first time ever this time. Mm -hmm. um, we put a drone up and uh, through an insanely detailed process that was far more detailed than I thought it was gonna be. Um, we did a count of all the uh, Street fair areas and the ancillary areas like nippers and all that kind of stuff, and came up with twenty. It was like twenty two nine eighty two, and that's how many people are there at one moment. And that's a what? Well, you take the one moment, and then you figure, okay, it's going to be kind of the same throughout the day. So it's it's really an estimate. Mm -hmm. um, There's a lot more people coming through right. but at any one time. It's not going yeah. to see all the formulas that are done are designed for static events, like a rally where people show up. Mm -hmm. Or not, or and, if you're worried really. but yeah, this is a little bit different because it's an eight-hour thing. Now you could put a drone up every hour and do head counts, but that gets a little no. It's a little stay all day though, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> you don't well, really with the beer garden, garden, some people do. That's for you know, yeah. beer garden. Uh, Tucker Reds was uh, there as well. With their, I'm going to make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, uh, Collins' plan to for uh, for uh, adjust fees. Uh, yeah, for festival. Billing. 
I'll second that. Uh, is the detail really clear here? I mean, I support what I've heard, um, but as the good specifics of a resolution, what's it? What are we Aren't you supporting him adjusting the fees, not the specific amounts? Yeah, it's it's his plan. Yeah, there's a motion under resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's got a lot of detail here. And the plan too is I'm working with Chief Burge, and she's putting together. A, like a booklet that will be given to people who come in for an event permit that will then list their requirements, public works requirements, and hours so that it's all up front um, and we don't have any issues. Well, <laughs> we reduce the chance, we reduce the chance of issues. So, anyway. Well, I repeat the question Would this be approving the 0 0.08 cent per estimated attendee? Yes. I would think so. Does that, does that exclude anything? I mean, by just saying that, and we, are we missing something? I think it's that, I mean, adjusting the festival permit fee and also, I mean, I don't know, do you have to approve the direct, like the staffing issue, like to, okay, yeah, that's, that's more of an operational issue. So yes, just a 0.08 cents. Okay, so we go. Hearing no more discussion, may we vote? Uh, it's been moved and seconded to approve uh, the fire department permit fee adjustment as specified. Mr. Winter? Yes. Ms. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. All right. Thank you. Does that mean you have to fly a drone at every event? No. No, <laughs> no because that's a hassle in and of itself because of the FAA regulations and stuff. Did you want to say anything about leadership? Mm -hmm. Moving right along. Uh, next item up for business, I think. Yeah. Paramedic, paramedic reimbursement. Uh, so Justin Turner is one of our paramedics. He's full time with us. Um, Justin went into paramedic class in the fall of 2020, I believe. It's Sinclair. Not Sinclair. The other one. Clark State. Um, he had applied for us to fund the class for him to pay for it, um, but we already had two people approved, uh, Georgia and TJ. So Justin paid for the class out of his own pocket, um, which is pricey. Um, as it turned out though, TJ ended up because of some personal problems that came up, um, dropping the class. So we never actually had to pay for him. And I think we just never, never really occurred to us that, Hey, wait, Justin was paying for it. Mm -hmm. Um, since then Justin's passed, he's extremely dedicated employee, um, and actually only works for us. He doesn't go anywhere else like a lot of people do, um, and has no plans to, um, in historically we have reimburse people in that situation if they've stayed with us mm -hmm. and signed a service contract. Um, and we'd like, you know, assuming I can sit down with Margaret and find areas where we can take that fund from, those, mo those monies from, I would like to do that and have him sign, you know, have him sign, he's more than open to signing a service contract. Um, but he provides us great service, he picks up extra shifts as needed, even while sometimes comes in on his own accord to help out with projects. Um, well, I'd make a motion to reimburse uh, Justin for his out-of-pocket expenses and uh, ask him to sign the standard service contract agreement. It's $89,000. No, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> surprised. Well, he used to be 4000 and now it's like uh, eight to something for apparently. But I don't know. Uh -huh. Got him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'll second that. Any other discussion about reimbursing Justin for is ambition, ambition and training and good service for training. Plus, Justin lives in Clifton, so he actually is a local resident, so. Or Clifton Heights. <laughs> Hearing no more discussion. We moved and seconded to reimburse um, firefighter paramedic Justin Turner for the cost of his certification course and with the signing of a two-year service contract. Um, Mr. Winter? Yes. Ms. Moore? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. So was it TJ's that just never claimed his, or he, he or he went and they, he had to pay, we paid it, but he... TJ, um, so I mean, he started the class with Georgia and then had to drop due so, to some issues. Then he went back and took it last year 
And there's this great confusion because I don't know. He never asked to be paid, reimbursed the second time. So I'm not sure who paid for it. But um, leadership development training, you can just read that yourself. Just a, it's just a FYI, something new we're doing. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I'd like to request an executive session. Hopefully this is worded the right way. <laughs> to discuss matters of personnel related to employee discipline. I'll make that motion. Okay. <laughs> second. I wasn't sure if that was still the way you do it. Five, four, three. 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 I make a motion to return the regular session at uh, 6, uh, 5, 5, 48. And I'll second that motion. And there was no specific action taken as a result of the executive session. Okay, you cover everything you want. Oh, you street first, you have to That's all I got. Contribu fireworks contribution. Where's my number one? Firework contribution. We cover it. Yeah, you can't cover that. No, it's in your year. Oh, okay. <laughs> Every year. In the past, we've always received a letter requesting, like the odd fellows, or whatever, yeah. a, a, a contribution from the board towards the purchase of fireworks for the 4th of July. This year, we did not receive that letter. We understand that there is a change in operations and et cetera, et cetera. But I, I don't think, maybe it's something or are you just thinking? I'm just thinking. Okay. Kind of okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think we should maintain the, the, the policy that we've had to be a supporting organization for the community, the 4th of July festivities, which we have for umpteen years. And at the last contribution, I think it was that, I assume it was last year, I didn't look it up, but we made a $750 contribution to the fireworks fund. And I would make the motion that we continue that tradition and make that contribution. I second okay. the motion to contribute $750. Why didn't they ask? I mean, do they want our money? No, no. They do want our money. Why they asked, why they didn't. Uh, I just have to assume it's because it's there's no paid people. Uh, yeah, because there's no real. I, yeah, I had know. some conversations with Mark Heiss and sounds like it. they're trying to figure out how to do it. They were trying to raise money in social media. Yeah. And then they got a lot of. Information handed over to them, so they just kind of took it. Oh, okay, well, they they got all the information handed over to them. <laughs> okay, so, well, um, it doesn't anyway, um, But they're struggling. They're, they, they're just getting their feet. They're, they're okay. figuring out what to do. So I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Any further discussion? Move uh, and seconded to um, support the Yellow Springs 4th of July fireworks as, as tradition in the amount of $750. Mr. Mutcher. Yes. Mr. Hollister. Yes. Mr. Moyer. I'll abstain. And I'll, I'll, okay, yes. I just <laughs> yeah, like, say why you're abstaining. So, say it's stay here, take our money. So, Is it yes or no? Yes, it's yes. Okay. 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 Shall I tell Margaret or would you want to? I shall tell Margaret. We have to develop a routine of when yeah. we make financial decisions at the board level. Yeah. But that information has to get to Margaret to be done because we right. come upon a few instances where. Right, that it didn't happen. What well, used to happen automatically? Yeah, because she yeah. was <laughs> right. Okay, star designates Margaret. Okay, Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. Eh? I'll mm -hmm. figure that out. Um, fire and EMS assessment update. I would already. Have, I mean, Frank has all the information. So, okay. Is there, I mean, sh should we not ask them how they're doing or is there anything else they need or I, where I think, are they or any of those things? Okay. I mean, we're just going to sit. You know, I'd like to make that call because I, I wanted to okay. ask that. Um, I'm hoping that we trustees get an interview and I was worrying about, I was not worrying, wondering about like some of the issues you were bringing up before the meeting. and. If that all, all is being considered, Marilyn will ask Frank Cook how's it going. I don't mean to be casual, but yeah. for an update on this. And as far as I know, he has everything that he requested from us that we were able to provide. 
does he have information on our our big financial picture? He, they uh, he asked for and received um, budget. I think for the last two fiscals. So Denny was able to run that out of UAN. So budget and gave him. I mean, I think he gave him like all the same reports you guys got, but the annual versions of those. So. So they seem to have all the data you would need. Okay. Oh. As I said, well, heard how about if we just get a little context that we have a contract uh, with a group recommended by the state firefighters fire, fire, chiefs, fire chiefs, chiefs Association to just review the operations of the fire department. Mm -hmm. Um, you make recommendations. And re make recommendations. Does this include uh, going over uh, employee and volunteer performance evaluations? No. That was not a, I mean, do we have a process for that that they are evaluating? Uh, he, the only thing would be, I mean, he did ask for a copy of both the Township Personnel Policy Manual and the department's standard operating procedures. Mm -hmm. So those are in there, and of course, you can follow up you know, questions. So. Um, so Denny's not here. Yeah, I thought he was going to give us an update on our much needed new email situation, but he's not here. We'll see him again. Um, Sometime. Yeah, the executive session, we're done. Is that it for fire? That's it for fire. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Fiscal officer um, has a resolution. The agenda has Secretary. Oh, of course. <laughs> See that set detail thing. <laughs> Dan was all set to sneak out there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Dan, <laughs> stay where you are. How's the cemeteries? Well, since the last meeting, we've had two burials. We have one ashes in Clifton and a full burial past Saturday in Glen Forest. We're going to have two ashes Friday, same family, double ashes. And then possibly a natural burial on Saturday for the recent traffic fatality. But I won't know until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like Saturday. Oak Grove or Prairie? I'm not sure. Okay. I have to meet with them. But they mentioned natural, so I'll know more tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> we worked on some of the birch trees today at the base side, the front side, pretty well trimmed back. So just got some on the back, natural oak grove side later. Yeah, you got those trimmed back quite a ways. That's good. Well, it still looks nice. Yeah, and, oh, it does. And it doesn't look bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> May I ask by which method? Uh, pull saw and whoppers. Thank you. Oh. You know, just as a side point of interest, I just want to make sure that you understand. And just because you know you haven't been yeah. through the cycle so many times, but these um, trimmers, these flailers, or no, they're not the flailers, it's a rotary, rotary that that we're using and everybody uses to go down the road mm -hmm. for two reasons, and it's not just to make things look pretty. They or they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but they, they will. Give them six months. I know, but give them six months. But our roads traditionally are agricultural roads, and they're used by large pieces of equipment, combines, cedars, all, all of that equipment. And those things take up a lot of room. They need as much room on the sides and on the top as necessary to, to get these things through safely. And that's the main reason that it's probably the main reason that we go through and we trim these things with this piece, this piece of equipment. Yeah. We couldn't hire 40 people to, mm -hmm. to trim the roads mm -hmm. to that extent, mm -hmm. to doing it by hand with a, with a pole saw and some yeah. loppers. So, oh, yes. it's just a necessary Oh, piece. I totally get it. Okay. Right. Well, yeah. There is... No, well, I'm still speaking. Um, I totally get the roads part. There's no way to take good those roads. It was the more intimate space of the natural burial cemetery that was scary, and and the thought of those river birches hanging there with their limbs 
you know, was left like a bad car accident that nobody attended. <laughs> you could hear screams as you. You could. You can. Them. You really can. So I totally. I want to know. I want you to know. I'm not being um. You know. Crunchy granola about the the roads that have to be maintained. I totally get that. It, it, it was those. It's when you mentioned possibly using that on the river birches that. Okay, but so, <coughs> thank you. I, I totally, I totally see. Apparently, that. Right there, nerve. <laughs> well, I I will speak no, I, no, on, on, on this <laughs> subject. There is another technology that I saw at the last state uh, <coughs> convention. And it's hard for me to describe, but it, so rather than s simply having the rotary blades cutting one direction, they're more like the real mowers that A flail. Um, there'll be two surfaces that cut. So when you look at the twig that's been shattered versus clipped, there's a difference. And over years, the impact on the different plants, it, it may be better to be clipped rather than sliced in one direction. Uh, that, that's not a topic for one of our trustee meetings, but I am just, and I don't think there's any way around it. I agree with the physical stuff that Chris is describing. But as someone who was trained as a tree trimmer, just going along and slashing is horrifying. Rather than, I mean, I have scolded people on the street here in town that is trimmers hired by the village, you know, pointing up at a branch that somebody else, maybe the same company, maybe another company, has trimmed four or five times wrong, generating more sprouts coming out that have to be trimmed, actually exaggerating the problem. Uh, it, it makes me sick. I don't have an answer to it in terms of the gross volume that we have to cut, but it's something being done not the way I was taught. Uh, okay, um, but you know, I don't want to along, devote along the next the half hour we're talking about, that. We're talking about those invasive pear trees and honeysuckles and, okay. That's true. Right. I don't care about them. <laughs> but, okay, thank you. But point well taken by both of you. Um, and, sorry. Well, in our defense. It has healed some. It doesn't look nearly as bad as it did two days after I done it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, I, and, and I, even though I do it, if you look at it, it's, it's very uniform shaped. It's very nicely done, even though there's some busted branches. And if we get something really bitter looking, and we could lop it off and make it look a little better. But you know that's just how we do it. So, but it does heal. And it, it does quickly. heal. Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> and they keep growing. And they'll, well, they'll that's grow. what I mean. It's healing. It's growing. Mm. Did you, um, ever, ever talk to the guy about the plow on um, Cub Deals? Where, 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 if I do, do you want to change the reserve to? Yeah. Okay. To so zero. That would be yeah, I don't know. I'll take away. the reserve off. I mean, when well, you say snowplow, you mean the little dump truck with the plow. Right. I will. All right. Pursue that. Thank the Lord. We got the cement apron already done. Mm -hmm. um, anything else for cemetery before we talk to the roads guy? <laughs> he is the roads guy. And the road guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this was the cemetery report. I thought we. Okay, we we, okay, we, we bled right into now. roads because there are roads in the center. We're, we're talking roads. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, we were talking roads. So I'll call about the truck tomorrow. I'll okay. try to get over there again. Um, we got a tree on Brian Park to clean up where Brandon had it come down. Monday. So I heard. Yeah, a tree, good size one. 
Mm-hmm. It's against the garden room. We got a little bit too much for him to do by himself. We're going to do that in the morning. We have to meet a lady at twelve thirty. Natural, probably celebrate a different lady. Than he got that hanging bra- branch that was down. Too. He got one high as he could reach it. The rest mm-hmm. of it's fine. Mm-hmm. It'll come down someday. Where, I'm sorry, where is Bryant that? Parker, John Bryant Park. And hopefully, they can start trimming a little bit tomorrow. Dan, did a tree come down on, on Grinnell Road near the sewage treatment plant? I think so, but that's county. I think it's just past there. Oh, okay. Because for one. some strange reason, I got a call from Yellow Springs Police Dispatch asking me about this tree that was down. There was a tree that fell the between button. there <laughs> between there and the bike path coming this way. It was leaning out over the road one day last week, but that, uh-huh. that was county. That's the county road. We, you know, had things laid in the road. We moved it for them, mm-hmm. but no, I, I realize that that that's not your road, but but, um, but there, there was, was why was, why they were calling me was the you, question. you told them that you had not issued a permit for it <laughs> for falling trees. Maybe that was it. Anything more before we move on to the fiscal officers? I'm going to get back out and work on the roads for sure next week. This week's kind of busy. I know. I know. I, 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 my lips are sealed. Hardly. Um, if not, if, if you don't mind, Marilyn, uh, Dan's not feeling very well today. Could he be excused from the meeting? Of course. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, we'll see you there. See you. Thank you. Um, fiscal officer, besides her resolution, was there anything? Probably not. Okay. There is an impending large problem with financials in the fire department, but we're going to have to work on it before we before we car roll. All right, Margaret has a resolution for us: Amendment Appropriate Resolution um, Twenty Twenty Three Thirty, Amendment of Permanent Appropriations. Whereas it is an ongoing process to accurately appropriate funds according to the needs of the township. Now, therefore, the trustees authorize amending the following appropriations. Cemetery fund um, increased by 450. Says in parentheses, water. Fire okay. fund. Okay. <laughs> I'll explain the water. That's cool. You don't have to. Well, Wait, she hasn't finished the fire fund. Fire fund okay. increase. Um, 21 um, compensation of board commission members increased by 8,000. Hmm. That's all. That, that's commission, compensation of who? Those are volunteers. I don't know why that would yeah. be that large of an increase. Yeah, fund. so. Too bad she's not here to ask her. Um, yeah, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Okay, Did you want to talk about water before we? Uh, oh, we don't. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'm, sure let's not. I'm sure there's a good <laughs> reason. No, I'm sure there's a good reason. There's a good reason, but I'll keep it to myself. It has to do with pumps and wells. It has to do with the new water line we put in. Oh yeah, the one that's at the leak. Mm-hmm. Marilyn, can you table that resolution to, until you get the information from Margaret, rather than making it for something that you don't understand why it's there? Gosh, you're reading my mind. More than likely, she's already spent that money. Uh, that's why it's on the table. I huh? move adoption of this resolution. One second. 2023-30. Any further discussion? Nope. Hearing none, maybe we vote. The move and seconded to adopt resolution 2023-30, amendment of permanent appropriations as enumerated. Ms. Foster? Yes. Ms. Nature? Yes. Ms. Mark? Yes. The resolution is adopted. I mean, I, we could have. Yeah, no, you, you, you could, could have done that, but it wasn't I, a I wise thing to do. And, and these aren't large numbers.
zoning inspector. Well, I think since I was last with you, I've only issued one permit. It was for a swimming pool on William and Mary Court. $101,000 swimming pool. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not cheap these days. Um, the zoning commission met. They uh, continued their discussion of uh, temporary use permits, and they acknowledged the need to start working on um, the solar regulations vis-a-vis -vis your, your moratorium for that, that purpose. And um, I, if I understood correctly, they sort of said, everybody's got homework. Take the fill-in-the-blank form that we were given and fill in the blanks, and then we can discuss what you put in the blanks as a way to, to start that process. Um, but that was not discussed at the, at the meeting. And no, um, I mean, no action was, was taken on any particular subjects, but there was um, continuing, what do I want to say, uh, looking at temporary use permits from a variety of perspectives. And there was, um, Richard Silliman came to the meeting and, and gave some information. Um, that, that stood out as not someone who's ever been at a zoning commission meeting before, I don't think. Uh, but that was, there wasn't um, anything else that stands out in my mind that took place at that meeting. And um, tomorrow night we have our first request for a temporary exemption permit other than the Chappelle shows to the BCA um, concerning the property at 115 Yellow Springs Fairfield Pike, the one I talked about, I think, two, maybe it was two months. No, it would have been right after Memorial Day, so I guess it was the last, the last meeting. Um, all I can say is I will be sitting there interested to see what, what happens. Uh, this situation is certainly different in so much as um, if, if when you look at the, the language in the code, it says that the temporary use permit can't involve the uh, building of any permanent structures. In other words, if you're doing something temporary, the building has to be, or the tent or whatever has to be temporary. And the property in question had uh, a pavilion, a gazebo, who, who knows what the right term is, built, um, actually built without a permit, which I pointed out to them as soon as I talked with them and said, you need to get a permit for this building. And I still haven't gotten an application for a permit for the building. But that's, that's a separate issue, except that if that building was built because they were regularly, and that's what this, this request is about. They have four scheduled events on the property already for coming up this year. Okay, so anyway, that, that's a little bit of the background for everyone to, to think about. Um, the other issue, and I I, I think I've mentioned it to the Zoning Commission, but I haven't harped on it, is that we may, depending on how you look at it, and I think we talked about this a little bit, have a loophole in our code from the standpoint of, we have no minimum time that you can lease a home, okay? And so what's happening is, in this situation, the house is being leased. They're not leasing the property for an event. They're just leasing the house. Theoretically, mm -hmm. all right, and then the people that lease the house do what they would do, right? And you could say, well, we don't require people who live here in the township to get a permit when they their son or daughter gets married. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the difference in this situation? And it, you know, and you have to decide: is it different or is it not different? Because um, if it's a family leasing the house, then they're 
living there, mm -hmm. and they should be able to do the, anything that anybody else does. Mm -hmm. But it's also somewhat obvious that they're not living there. How far apart are these four events that have already been scheduled? One is this month, and the other three, I think, are all in September. So, by the model you just described, there are three different people leasing the house during September. Yeah. So, a person could have a wedding at their house, even if they're leasing the house, but if somebody leases a house for a weekend, they could also have a wedding. That's, you're saying that's what the loophole well, is? That's that's the distinction that yeah. the, the code doesn't address. In other words, yeah. it's perfectly legal in Miami Township to rent a house. Yeah. Even, I mean, for, even for the owner to rent it or for you to rent it from. Even for 48 hours. Yeah, but the question is for 48 hours, does that give you all the privileges of being someone that, that leased it for a year or you know some other amount of time? Are, and, you, are you allowed to tell us what these events are? I know one was a well, two, of, two of them are weddings. One is a, a book, signing. book signing. What was the third one? Or the fourth one? Somehow it's not in my mind at the, at the moment. And the weddings were the, were the larger activities. The book signing is somewhat obviously commercial. I mean, even if they don't sell books at the book signing, the purpose is to promote the book. I would, I would think. I mean, you no, know, I, I go back to when the prosecutor told me that when the truck pull operation was going on, and they told me that it was a totally nonprofit, that the gate proceeds all went to just pay for the trophies, and you know nobody made any money. And the prosecutor said, "Money's changing hands. It's commercial activity." All right. So, how do you when you decide whether something is commercial or not? Um, it's sort of more, you know, does it quack like a duck? Mm -hmm. Rather than some specific test of, you know, somebody wrote a check or purchased goods. But that's, that's not up to me. That's, that's just clearly you would have to give someone a permit to do that. Whereas if you're living there and having a wedding for your, your family, then the question is, is that... That's fine, it's not a commercial activity. And you even need a permit then to do it. Mm -hmm. So why are they getting temporary use for these weddings? Was it their, there, because was it their when, idea? Or because the event that occurred Memorial Day weekend was clearly commercial. And I told them that they could not do that without a permit. How was it clearly commercial, I'm sorry? That there were vendors there selling products. Not according to the owner. The owner said that they didn't know that that was happening. But I have uh, photo documentation and confirmation from one of the vendors that they were there. I just asked. Okay. Interesting. Well, anyway, it's you know, the same. So it's, it's, it's not anywhere. Oh, and the other thing was, and, and could I also get a permit for, you know, on, through October for anything else that might come up? And I, I said, I said, that's kind of vague, what you're asking for. You may want to be more specific, but ultimately, this is the Board of Zoning Appeals determines, they could say, that nah, you don't, you know, everything's fine, you don't need a permit. That's, that's within their, their purview. Um, the, you know, the, I sit and think about when I present information to the BZA, how I can present facts rather than opinions to them. And, and, but I can also give scenarios. In other words, the, you know, yes, we, every, every person that I've chatted with about a wedding in the neighborhood is yes, weddings are kind of loud and I don't get to sleep at the usual time, but of course my neighbors are gonna have a, a wedding for their daughter and that's fine. The question is nobody has so many children that there's one potentially every weekend or weekend after weekend. Mm -hmm. And that's 
That's what our code never thought about, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. But that could happen. And that's, um, you know, and maybe we say, well, the code doesn't address it, so right now it's fine. And then it's something that we need to decide whether the code needs to be changed or it's perfectly fine to have a wedding every weekend on a Which on a is approximately what happened at the last BZA hearing. You said the code didn't, doesn't address it. It's not for the BZA to interpret or well, the which, which BZA the hearing are you For the Chappell, um, the, the Weary Pavilion. The, I'm not privileged. They didn't no, discuss that in public. I don't know. I what, mean, I was how just they the back and forth testimony that I was following in the room. It was um, most of its discussion centered around um, the temporary use not being specific enough to. Well, the, okay, there was discussion yeah. about different people had different interpretations of what the word temporary meant, and I do remember that. I mean, I think David Newhart said. You know, our, our code says that a temporary use permit is good for up to 12 months. And I think Dave looked at that and said, you've had more than 12 months now of, of permission, so we can't give you any more. And, and the, the counter argument was temporary meant it wasn't all the time. All right, so you can do it every year as long as it's not all the time. You know, it doesn't matter how many times, it's just, you know, if your, your permit is for three months, then it's temporary. So a person Even could, if it's for three months every year, it's still temporary. So a person could rent a house and have their a wedding, and can three or four people rent the same house and have a wedding? Yes, exactly. And that, well, that's more, I mean, in this case, we've only got two people listed on the request, but it's multiple. Different people, different weddings, within a week or two of each other. We'll see. Um, the the other one that the applicant approached us about is the, the Patron on Kyle Road. Um, they were asking about why they can't just get there. They wanted to appeal your decision to say that they're not a farm. They, yeah. Well, they, they said that to me, and I said, and I wrote back to them, and I well, first of all, they had sent some additional information to me, and so I reviewed that information and wrote back to them, and I said, you know, I you, the information you gave me didn't change the rationale that I laid out when I denied your 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 permit in the first place. That I said, if you want to appeal this. I need to understand what 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 it was in the in the in the, in the facts that I gave you that you're contesting. In other words, they didn't say no. We're a farm because they just said we want to do this. They said we're a farm because I mean they, they well they might not have met the the facts the um, level of detail that. Okay, well, I Evidence specifically said to them, this is the information that I need. In other words, the, it's, it's somewhat, it's yeah. fairly clear in the code that it has to be productive farmland, okay? Their case is they, their farm is a forest, right? And I asked them to show what their produce was from the forest. Have they, you know, did they sell a tree last year or within the last 10 years? Or are the trees designated to be sold? Does their forestry management plan, you know. Are you allowed to ask them that specifically from which well, which part are they? Uh, they have to be. All right. I totally. All right. I asked them for the information that I thought the BZA would need to consider. Now, I, maybe that's overstepping my bounds. I don't know, um, because they were 
bringing it to us and thought there was a roadblock, we asked our attorney. So um, I thought I'd share a copy of that with you because that's great information or it's a piece of the puzzle. I don't know how. What she, she, what she, she, suggested, she, she suggested that they have the right to to ask for their BZA hearing without providing more documentation. Well, is is did you just give Richard copies of the emails that went back and forth? Is it something uh, I've already just, seen? It's just uh, the no. I don't think you did. This, this is a. Mm -hmm. This is from Jen Huber. Friday, June thirtieth, to Maryland, uh, privileged and confidential, and it, and it yeah. it's specific comments on different parts of the. No, I can't. I mean, without reading, yeah. I can't yeah. tell. Some of it relates, like regarding culinary cabin, right? That was their term. So I think I have seen this. Agriculturally related education. Da, 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 da. I, I guess what I'm asking is, does she have the... the I bet. It's okay, so anyway, I asked them for that information. I've heard nothing from them. They didn't yeah. say, no, we just want to appeal. Now, well, I can write they, back to them if, if you they, think if, it's appropriate they, and say, I'll schedule a BZA hearing. If, if they said, um, if they said, you know, I just want to appeal, could, could they do that? Well, that's, that's, yeah, I think that ultimately, I mean, all right, I'm going through a process that I think is appropriate for my position. Anybody can question that at any time. All right, so that's perfectly fine. The, the second in set of information they sent included things that weren't true. In other words, they told me that their, their other two pieces of property were under CAUV, and part of the reason that I was learning about CAUV was to find out that you don't have to be a farmer to get CAUV. It isn't, that doesn't, you know, because you have CAUV doesn't mean it's a bomb. Um, but anyway, and when I, I got false information from them okay. by calling the county auditor. Because and they're, they're not under CAUV? Not, not what they said they were. The, the 25 acres is, but when they wrote back, they said, our other two properties, which are part of our farming operation, and and, they, and we're part of our educational farming operation, which we're continuing, want to continue on this property, da 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 da. The, the history they were giving me didn't jive with what the auditor's office told me. And I think, you know. So what happens if they appeal and they disagree with your decision that they're actually a farm, then do they show up and there's inadequate information for the BZA to make no, that, a I mean, the BZA can ask for whatever they want. And they ask it prior to the hearing? Well, they, they don't have to have it prior to the hearing. It's oh, just... They could ask okay. for it then and then ask... They could ask for it and then continue the hearing until okay. they got it. Okay. Um, so All right, I think... The copies of emails that, I, that was shared didn't include the original permit application. What did they want a permit for originally? Agritourism. They, they never act. They, they, did, did they say what kind of agritourism? They described what they wanted to do. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll ask about it later because I haven't seen that. I can, I can send that. Yeah, to normally you. we don't see them. Right. Uh, but I'm, because I yeah. saw a subsequent yeah. email that had to see the original. That maybe you yeah. have something, something that will we should be able to see eventually. Um, no, you okay. you know, everything I, none, none of the, the information I get when someone makes an application is privileged in any way. If anytime you all want any copies of, of any of that, you're welcome. Well, that's... Well, if we don't I know think, it exists, we can Yeah, well, it. okay. But, if, right, if, or if, if you they, want it to be a procedure, yeah, that whenever someone page. applies for a zoning permit, I send you a copy well, or put it on the table, it. something like uh, that. Yeah, I have something more elaborate plan, like filing system. Maybe. But we can talk about that. Yeah, I think, I think we need to work together with getting the records so we can go like, let me look up that, you know, Patron application, see see what happened, okay. and that kind of thing. And I know that's um, okay. But the Patron wrote me a letter. They didn't 
make an appointment to make an application. Do, would they do that on the building permit application? Is yeah, there an they, agritourism? Well, so agritourism now is regulated in our code to the extent that we can regulate it. Mm -hmm. So they, they still they have to get a permit no matter what, okay? But I told them that I didn't think they actually qualified. Right? And, and so maybe the, the appropriate thing to do on this is to, is to fill out a permit and then, you know, we don't have a line on there that says no, but, you know, this permit is denied and have that, that paper trail. So um, the only thing I've ever seen is the zoning permit. Yep. We that, know, that's a kind of a catch-all? Well, because we have very few things that require a permit that we don't have a form for. But, and but I'm saying, maybe we, we yeah. I'm trying to think about whether our standard form could be used for an agritourism request or not. See, if someone comes in and they want to build a house, and I say, you don't have enough setback here, I can't issue you a permit. And usually, it's that simple, okay? Um, matter of fact, it's very rare that we don't work it out in the office. But when someone comes in and says, I'd like to do something, and we talk about it, and why, you, you know, you can't or can't, or here's the part of the code that's not clear about this, mm -hmm. and then people decide, you know, what, what next step they want to take. Yeah. So, uh, when they act, uh, <clears throat> they asked for a permit for agritourism. They were asking for a permit for an activity, not a structure. Yes and no. This has had two phases to it. The first phase, I don't think, asked for any structures. The second phase did. Or referred to a structure in the future. <laughs> Now, structures, except there are setback requirements and, and height limitations, are probably not going to be an issue. Um, what's the, the, I don't know whether this is an issue, but if, if the, the qualification for this being a farm is because it's a managed forest, all right, then there has, there generally, I think has to be a forestry management plan. There was one on the property when they bought it. It has since expired this, through the state program, but it doesn't have to be through the state program. I have no way of knowing if they've got a management plan now. But that was one of the things I asked for was a copy of their management plan mm -hmm. all right, to back up their claims that it's a farm because just because you own land doesn't make it a farm. How? Why do you think that the? Okay. Well, why do you think that the twenty five hundred that that they they have to have the, the minimum they have to sell was from, was from was from? But they actually uh, don't have to have twenty five hundred. That was them bringing that up. But that's one way of measuring that it's productive. You can have le if you have ten acres. It qualifies as a farm as long as you're producing anything as far as, as farming goes. And farm production is spelled out in the code, and it's one of those things that's not exactly black and white. But the other thing is that if you have less than 10 acres, if you can show that you made income on the average per year of $2,500 from agricultural production, then it's considered a farm. By the state of Ohio, so it's, it's the state. So you don't include you don't include their, their twenty five plus their nine point two across the street. You don't consider that greater than ten. The the for the purposes of the agritourism, it has to be contiguous land. Does it? That's what it says. At least that's the way I read it. You can put your farm into conservation, okay, and it's still a farm, but a certain portion of it still has to be under production. You can't put your whole farm 
you know, under conservation and not not be producing anything. Are they producing on the twenty-five acres? Well, that's that's one of the questions. Is it can they document any production on the, those acres? If they if they document production on those acres, then then we're not then we're down to whether what they want to do is agritourism. We and, haven't even talked about that. Yeah, and if um, they want to have a BZA hearing without producing the evidence, do they have a right They to can have a BZA hearing no matter what. I okay. suggested to them that this information would be appropriate before I scheduled a BZA hearing. Yeah, that's 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 where the miscommunication okay, came that's, in. That's, that's where the miscommunication came in because they thought you were saying, they thought you were saying I'm not scheduling a, a BZA hearing for you until you produce this information. I love it. And I don't and I may have, have said it in such a way that that's the way it was interpreted. Okay. But I well, that, asked that, for that more information things. before I scheduled the hearing. Okay, that, that clarifies things. Uh, that. And I think though, let's let's change gears for a minute. We, meaning the trustees and the zoning inspector, need to clarify our procedures. Having two different people saying two different things to someone is not a good way to run a business. Yeah, we have to we have to clarify and, and, and do a lot of things because we're not, and it's not not anyone's well, it's probably somebody's fault or the organizations. We're not seeing the information. So things, if 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 the um, applicant hadn't contacted us we would be yeah. happily oblivious that anybody even yeah. applied. And so, and, and I know we brought up that your, your job description is not clear. And so the, um, I think we just need to, I think we just need to make improvements on our records and our, our information sharing system, which is going to include like no more personally emails and that's that goes you know for all of us because the um it becomes very blind when when there's a lot of things going back and forth and we don't have access to them and that's through no no one's not um no one's fault we just we need we have a lot of tidying up to do at this well, moment how would we proceed with that I mean, how it's seen over the last couple of years of well, it feels as if there's been a ramping up of uh, zoning issues. And, yes. Uh, well, I think we need working with you. I got examples. We're, we're talking to our attorney of things we should have, and I and I don't even really know all the different applications you have, but an application for zoning, application for. Um, Things having to do with the BZA, like conditional use variance and appeals. Um, possibly we need an ag exemption application or an ag tourism. Mm -hmm. One for um, um, rezoning application or text map. And when those, and may, maybe they'll be fillable online or maybe it will just be printed out old school and handed in, but those have to go then go into a file with, with, in the year. And the person says, however we want to do it, these are all the building permits or zoning permits for 2023, or these are all the agriculture permits for 23, or you have individual files for. Well, then the, what's the our next people. step? How should we? Our next step is. Should we to, ask Richard to outline proposed changes, or do we, do well, individual I, trustees I, to I, lay out what they think might happen, or what? Um, I've done some work on that with Jen Huber and. Um, and I think, me, I think me and Richard together could come up with a system. I, I, I hate, first of all, I didn't put it all on Richard, you know, and everybody has strengths. No. Richard, I mean, Richard example, has a brilliant mind, I'm not up sure. Permit forms for everything that I think our standard permit form doesn't cover, or I can modify our standard permit form and make it two pages rather than one, so it has more blanks to fill in depending on what it is you're asking for. Yeah. That, that's okay. and um, and that's 
actually kind of a process of uh, going through the code and seeing what are all the different things the public can ask yeah. for, rather than trying to say, oh, what what can people come to me and ask for a permit for? Yeah, well, I've done um, some of the, and I can and I can do that, and I don't I don't see a problem with that. What and but some of these applications, for example, if you were going to do an agritourism application, there would be the specific information that was needed to match what we can regulate, and then there would be you know now a, a paragraph or you know whatever space describing what the agritourism activity is going to be. That's um, yeah. you know you can't you can't spell it out. I don't think any, in any more detail than that. Mm -hmm. It isn't it isn't as specific as, as the building permits, which pretty much say you've got to tell me what the estimated cost is, you have to show me where the building is going to be on the property, and and generally speaking, how tall it's going to be. And that's all there is to regulate. On the building permits. Yeah. So how about I come to you with with the set of documents, we hash it out. But well, when you say come to me with a set of documents, like uh, proposed, what what it would look like, um, what an ag what an agritourism permit would look like, what a um, an application for the BZ. Yeah, no, BZ that's, that's, that, like. that's that's and fine with me. And, and just, then I'm just thinking maybe going the other direction would be more efficient. Okay. Other, I have more experience with permits. For zoning, you, you do than you do, but maybe it's advantageous to have a completely new perspective on it. Well, the the, the piece I'm concerned about is you have great knowledge in the zoning and and the great experience in it, but I'm talk, but the per piece you don't you doesn't seem to be your forte is how it gets into a usable form, uh, not a usable form, a usable database for. The trustees, like, I couldn't go in there and find. Oh, let's. Last year, I remember this person applied for a permit for this. Mm -hmm. I think I'll go look it up and see see what his thinking was on that. Okay. Yeah, so that's we can, the we that's can the piece. designate a filing cabinet. They're all there. Yeah. All right. It's just they get moved around and put different places and. And yeah, so that, that's I would feel comfortable combined. if the two of you plan to meet and go into more detail on this. That sounds great. That's good because no more than those two can meet. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we should. Only. So, um, just so that um, it gives us legal coverage. You know, so, so, I mean, for one thing, in talking to Jen, she said, well, somebody called and they could request any of it. They could do a public records request at sure. any time, and mm -hmm. we, we would not be prepared. So, yeah, exciting. And um, just things are just uh, ramping right. up. It seems we're getting more and more requests for people to do creative things, so. Is that not a true statement? I don't know if I would use the term creative, but we are certainly getting creative requests to do things that we have not had requests to do in the past. Creative uses for their land and how, how they might use the code to make their plans come true. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the loophole. Well, yeah. Uh, a potential loophole. Well, I think, you know, loophole means, in my mind, that there's a way to do something legally that was not intended to be legal. You know, um, when sometimes someone comes in and they want to do something, and I say, you know, off the top of my head, I don't think I can permit that, but let's look and see if there's, if the code provides any exceptions for this situation or, or some other perspective than, you know, what it says here in this chapter, because there are, our code is set up that there are chapters of exceptions, okay, as well as, you know, what is written in the first chapter. My goal is always to try to, to enable the people that come to me to do what they want to do. But when the code, in my reading of the code, says you can't do it, then I have to say no. 
I don't have the authority to to go beyond the code. Um, let's see. At this point, I'd like to. Do I entertain a motion for an executive? Do I? Enter, I'd like to enter an executive um, session for the purpose of. Um, I have it written here. Uh, come on, Cynthia, back me up. I have it here. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Uh, I was going to circle it. Same as last one? Yes. Consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, promotion, demotion, or compensation of a public employee. Executive. Do we have to make a motion to do it? I think you just did. <laughs> I think you just did. Do we have a second? Uh, second. Seven or six forty-four. Mm -hmm. 